1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Take note, this is a new beginning for mankind, right? Because the entirety of the earth, together with those who live on the land, they were completely eradicated. And so we have a new opportunity, a new start for mankind. When you want to, when you begin something new, what you want more than anything is the blessing of our Almighty God. So God bless Noah and his sons because they were going to do something that for the glory of God. What is that? The Bible says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That is not an easy task. After all, there were only how many of them? Only eight. And so with the eight, they are to be fruitful multiply and fill the earth. This was the command of God to Noah and his sons. The good thing is they have the blessing of God. And when you have the blessing of God, you have the provision of God. And so when we read chapter 9 of the book of Genesis, we see how God helps Noah and his sons fulfill this mandate to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Next slide. We're going to look at God's help so that human beings can multiply and fill the earth. What is one of God's help? Genesis 9 verse 2, the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand. They are given. The Bible says the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth. In other words, animals will be made to fear mankind. Even gorillas, even dinosaurs, even leopards and lions. When you think about these wild beasts, they are more powerful physically than human Beings, who do you think will win a fight? A lion or a human being? Shaquille O'Neal or a polar bear? We know the answer to that question. No match for the strength and brute power of, you, of beasts, right? And when you think about beasts, when they multiply quite rapidly, much quicker and swifter than human beings. Can you imagine if the beasts of the earth were not afraid of human beings? They will take over the planet, right? Especially since there were only eight of them. And so God placed into the instincts of beasts and animals the fear of mankind. That way they are protected from the beast. However, does it mean we are to be cruel to animals? Let's read the book of Proverbs 12 and the verses 10. Good people take care of their animals. But wicked people are cruel to theirs. So it's God's will that we treat our pets nicely. This is why the pet industry is a booming industry. We even have pet hospitals and pet hotels, pet insurance. You name it, it's available. Well, that's a good thing because God wants us to take care of animals. And so that's number one. Next slide, please. God's help, protection from the beasts, so that human beings can multiply and fill the earth. How else does God help Noah and his sons? Genesis 9 verse 3, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And, I, and as I gave you the green vegetables and plants, I give you everything. And so after the flood, there is the indication that God permits them to eat meat. No longer are they confined to eating just vegetables. Now they can eat meat. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Why did God choose this? Perhaps because human beings need more nourishment. Maybe after the flood, something happened to the earth, and so it would not produce the same kind of nourishment from the vegetation that was on the planet Earth. For whatever reason, God has given man permission to eat anything that moves, to eat the flesh of all animals. However, there is a condition. What is that? Next slide, Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. Only, and this is a big only, only 
You shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood. And so the prohibition from eating blood, this was given by God ever since the time of Noah. Noah and his sons. And so if we're going to eat meat, what do we do after we hunt and kill the animal? We are to pour out its blood and cover it with dirt. And so, next slide, God has given mankind additional sources of food. So protection from beasts, additional sources of food to help humankind to multiply and fill the earth. What else? Next slide, Genesis 9, 5 to 7. And I will require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Now be fruitful and multiply and repopulate the earth. What else did God give to help mankind flourish upon the earth? God gave a command, which we can say is capital punishment. Remembered, the flood just took place. Millions of people were put to death. They were destroyed. Perhaps human beings, the people, uh, Noah and his sons, they probably did not consider or they forgot the value, the sanctity of human life. After all, they just saw with their own eyes so many people just perish. And so God says and reminds them that human beings were created in his own image. Therefore, out of respect for humankind, what does God forbid? We must not kill. We must not murder. Why? Because if we murder, then we are ruining God's image because God made human beings in his own image. And so God wants us to be protected from beasts and also to be protected from our selves. Can you imagine when, if people were to end up killing each other? What do you think would happen to the population? It would not increase and multiply, right? God wants the population to increase, be fruitful, and multiply and fill the earth. Next slide. So we have so far three, protection from beasts, additional sources of food, protection from each other, and also number four. What is that? Next slide. A promise. God gave a promise to Noah and his sons. What is this promise? Let's read Genesis 9, 8 to 17. And God told Noah and his sons, I hereby confirm my covenant with you and your descendants and with all the animals that were on the boat with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, every living creature on earth. Yes, I am confirming my covenant with you. Never again will flood waters kill, a li kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Then God said, I am giving you a sign of my covenant with you and with all living creatures for all generations to come. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I send clouds over the earth, the rainbow will appear in the clouds. And I will remember my covenant with you and with all living creatures. Never again will the flood waters destroy all life. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant between God and every living creature on earth. Then God said to Noah, Yes, this rainbow is the sign of the covenant I am confirming with all the creatures on earth. And so what did God do to help human beings repopulate the earth? God inspired them and assured them with a promise. What is that promise called? You know, when God makes a promise, he doesn't just give it verbally. He doesn't just make a promise. What does God do? Did you notice how many times this word appears in this passage? What is that word that kind of jumps out at you? Covenant, right? God says, I will confirm my covenant. I'll give you a sign of my covenant. I will remember my covenant. 
And so God has made a covenant with Noah, his sons, and all the creatures on the earth. By the way, do you know what a covenant is? What is a covenant? Any, anyone? Yeah? Sister Piel, covenant? She's giving me that beautiful smile. <laughs> ask my mom, all right? You can ask the mother of Sister me, Sister Piel. What is a covenant, Sister Jolita? <laughs> What is it? Yeah, it's like an agreement. It's like an agreement. It's like you make a promise, right? You know, when God tells us he's going to do something, oftentimes he doesn't just say it. He makes it formal. He makes it official. For example, if I were to give you a promise verbally, me giving you a promise verbally, is that something that you can be comfortable with? Probably not, depending on the person, right? If he's trustworthy or not. But if you have an official document with your signature, then the agreement becomes what? A covenant. And so a covenant is something that is made official with a signature. And so God makes an agreement and he makes his agreement official because he has given his signature. Do you know what that signature is? <laughs> Next slide, please. What is that signature? I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. When I see the rainbow in the clouds, I will remember the eternal covenant. So the signature, what makes it official, what makes it a covenant, is the rainbow. And so when God sees the rainbow, he will remember the covenant that he has made. What is this covenant all about? Bible says, never again will flood waters kill all living creatures. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. Can you imagine? You're repopulating the earth and thinking in the back of your mind, what if God destroys this whole thing again? <laughs> right? You're not going to be too inspired. So God gives them assurance. I'm giving the rainbow to show you, to prove to you, I am committed to my promise. Never again. Will the whole earth be destroyed by means of a flood? And to whom does God make this covenant with? Next slide. 9, 18, and 17. The green. I am confirming this covenant with all creatures on earth. And so this covenant that he made with Noah, it is called a universal covenant. Different from the Abrahamic covenant. Because the Abrahamic covenant was made to a specific group of people. And this, that covenant is what we're going to study, not today, but in other Bible studies. So the Noahic covenant, the covenant that God makes here, it is for all of the creatures on earth, for all life forms. And so God has given his blessing upon Noah and his sons so they can multiply and be fruitful and fill the earth. And so who will be responsible to, for repopulating the earth? Genesis 9, 18 to 19, the sons of Noah went out, who went out of the boat were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three sons of Noah were the ancestors of all the people on earth. So one of these individuals would represent the line from which the promised seed will come from, right? So all of us here are either related to Shem, to Ham, or to Japheth. If you get to choose, who would you want to choose? If you, got the, if you had the opportunity to choose which ancestor would be your ancestor, would it be Shem? Ham or Japheth? Which would you choose? Ham. How many said ham? Yeah? Galophil says ham. How many wants Japheth? Japheth. Who wants Japheth? Did you notice the, uh, the title of our lesson today? The sin of ham. <laughs> so, so somebody wanted ham. Right? Is it Shem, Ham, or Japheth? One of the three would be a, an ancestor of who? The promised seed, our Lord 
Jesus Christ. Is it Shem? Is it Ham? Is it Japheth? We need to know. We got to know. You know what? When I read this passage right here, it seems that who is the oldest? Shem, Ham, Japheth. When you read that passage like that, it looks like it's the birth order of the son. Shem first, then Ham next, and then Japheth is the youngest son, right? But is that the case? Sometimes when you look, look at a genealogy or a chronology, it doesn't always represent birth order. For example, this chronology in 1 Chronicles 1, verse 28, the sons of Abraham were Isaac and Ishmael. Who was the firstborn? Ishmael. Who was the secondborn? Isaac. Sometimes in the Bible, when you look at the birth order, or when you look at the genealogy, when they list kids, when they list sons and daughters, it's not by birth order, but by importance of their contribution to the history of God's people, its contribution to the biblical narrative. And so Isaac comes first, Ishmael comes second. And even in this genealogy, it doesn't, it doesn't mention the other sons of Abraham, next slide, Genesis 25, 1 to 2, Abraham again took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shula, Shua. Those are nice names. <laughs> I love those names. One of my grandkids are going to be named after one of these ones. Zimran, hi Zimran, <laughs> Zimran Dizon, wow, or Shua, Jokshan. Those are nice names, but you know what? They were not included in the genealogy there in Chronicles. Why? Because it doesn't contribute to the genealogy. It doesn't contribute to the narrative about God's work of redemption. So when you see a genealogy, it doesn't automatically mean it's birth order. Okay. So we still need to know, well, who came first? Who was the oldest? Who was the second? Who was the third? In Genesis chapter 10, verse 21, this is what it says. Sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. So problem solved, right? We now know who the oldest is. Who is it? Japheth. But there's a problem. We read Gen Genesis 10, 21, right? In the NIV. Let's read it in the TEV. Genesis 10, 21. Same verse. Shem, the older brother of Japheth, was the ancestor of all the Hebrews. Oh boy. <laughs> we have the same verse, two different translations. One says Shem is the older. The other says Japheth is the older. And so what are we going to do? When you have problems with translation, you have to look at the you have to look at the Bible. We can't do the original here because it's a matter of uh, the, uh, we have to look at the structure of the grammar. And it's not always clear in this case. So we are stuck. But this is where we get to look into the scriptures because it gives us clues so that we can determine who the oldest actually is. Uh, so we, we look at Genesis 11 verse 10. It says, these are the descendants of Shem. Okay. Two years after the flood, when Shem was 100 years old, he had a son, Arfakshad. And so when Shem was 100 years old, he had a son, right? When was this? Two years after the flood. And so how old was he after the flood? How old was he after the flood? Huh? Two years after the flood, he was a hundred. So two years during the when the flood ended, how old was he? Ninety-eight. How long was the flood for? One year, right? Or one year, the flood. So before the flood, or right on the day of the flood, how old was Shem? Shem was ninety-seven. Wait a minute. When did Noah begin to have sons? When he was, next slide, 500. Right? What would that mean? 
it would mean that Japheth was born, or Shem was born, when he was 503 years old. Make sense? So who was born when he was 500? The older brother. Who was that? Japheth. So it's Japheth, Shem, and Ham. Why are we sure Ham is the youngest son? Genesis 9, 24, 25. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, curse be Canaan. Who was the father of Canaan? Ham. So the youngest is Ham. So, next slide. The birth order, according to scriptures, is the oldest is Japheth. Next comes Shem. So, Shem is the second born. The firstborn is Japheth. And the youngest son is Ham. Japheth, Shem, then Ham. So, now we got the orders correct. We're going to ask you, remember... In the Holy Scriptures, the firstborn gets the blessing, right? Gets the inheritance. So who's supposed to get the blessing here? Who's supposed to receive the spiritual heritage that will be passed on from Noah? Who should, who should it be? Japheth. And so I'm going to give you another chance. Another chance. If you got the chance to select who your ancestor would be, would it be Japheth, Shem, or Ham? If somebody says Ham, <laughs> who would it be? Who would you want? Huh? Would it be the firstborn Japheth, secondborn Shem, or the youngest? How many say Japheth? Raise your hand. All right, we have a couple of Japhets. How about Shem? How many here? Okay, some of you selected Shem. I wonder why you selected Shem. You like to be the middle child or the second child? Yeah? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and figure out what's going on. Let's go find out where... The Lord Jesus Christ will be coming from Japheth, Shem, or Ham. And so let's go to Genesis chapter 9, 22 to 23. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Okay, what happened here? Here's Noah. You know, um, Noah actually, after the flood, he planted a vineyard, and he made some wine. <laughs> he drank the wine, and he got drunk. drunk. Is it wrong to drink wine? No. What's wrong? When you drink, because when you drink and you get drunk, when you, what's wrong is you get drunk. Because when you're drunk, what happens to you? You do things you're going to regret, right? This is why drunkenness is often associated with immorality, right? I like this Japanese proverb. I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to remember this Japanese proverb I heard once about a drink. Um, anyone here remember that Japanese proverb about a drink? You see, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I forgot. I forgot the Japanese proverb, but it's a really nice one. But I, I was just trying to think of it. That's why I was pausing. Like, what's that Japanese proverb? But anyways, when you get drunk, it's not good. Noah got drunk, <laughs> and because he got drunk, what happened to him? got naked <laughs> right and it was taboo to be naked uh, especially back then and when Noah got drunk and he was naked he was inside his tent okay and Ham happens to be peeking in <laughs> so what does he see he sees his father naked and so what does he do the Bible says he told his two brothers outside. Wait a minute. If that was you, if, for example, okay, your cousin, your best friend, you saw naked and drunk in your backyard, what would you do? <laughs> if that was you, 
if you saw someone you love naked and drunk in your backyard, what would you do? Are you going to call? Are you going to take a picture? Are you going to post it on Facebook? Is that what you're going to do? <laughs> Most probably. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you going to do a Facebook Live? <laughs> you're going to cover it, right? You want to protect the honor of the person that you love. But here's Ham. What does he do? Instead of protecting the honor of his father, by covering him up, what does he do? He tells the two brothers. And so when the two brothers find out, what do they do? The Bible says they go into the tent and they went backward and covered his nakedness. And take a note, their, face were, their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness because it was taboo to see the nakedness of your father. And so because of this, we can see that Ham was different in character from the other two, Shem and Japheth. Ham was a gossip. When he finds out something bad about a person, what does he do? He wants to broadcast because it makes him feel good, makes him feel better, right? But Shem and Japheth, they were honorable people. And so what they decided to do? To cover the nakedness of their father. What does that indicate? Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Does this mean we condone sin? What do you think? No. We want to help people who have a problem with sin. We don't condone sin. Does it mean we broadcast the personal sins of individuals? No. no. That's why in the church, right? We're not going to ask you, hey, did you get drunk last night? It's a private thing. It's between you and God. However, if for some reason it leaks out and people begin to notice that you have a problem with drunkenness, that's a different story. When God begins to expose the things you do in private and it affects other people, then we have to take action. What kind of action? Galatians 6, 1 to 2. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Did you get that? If it's a private sin, it doesn't affect anyone, that's between God and that person. You don't go meddling in their business, right? But if it's exposed, then God is telling us we have to help that person because they cannot do it by themselves. Did you get that? But who and what should be exposed? <laughs> Let's read Ephesians 6, uh, 11, 6 to 11, 5, 6 to 11. No one, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you were light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And so when the sin is public, when the sin affects others, when the sin leads to deception, if it's not private, like Noah, I was private, I was in his own tent, right? But if it's public and it affects people, the Bible says we have to expose the work of darkness and expose those who are deceiving. And so that is one caveat concerning that. But if it's a private thing, we should not meddle into the private affairs of our brothers and sisters in the faith. In other words, no gossips. Can you imagine we're talking amongst each other? We're having dinner. You mentioned a couple of words here, a couple of words there, because there's a casual conversation. And then all of a sudden you spread it to this person and that person spreads it to this person, becomes different. What happens? You stir up dissension, right? Don't let, let's not let that happen uh, to us. That was the sin of Ham. Later on, we're going to talk about the sin of Ham and kind of look at it deeper. But let's just go ahead and move on. Genesis 9, 22, 24 to 25. 
Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, uh oh, he said, Cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. That's interesting. And so when Noah gets over his hangover, right? And he's of sound mind and realizes what his son, Ham, did to him. What did he do? Curse, him. curse be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will be to his brothers. There was a curse that was made to the line of Ham. Now, this was not Noah cursing uh, his son and his grandson. This was Noah uttering a prophecy from God. Remember, Noah is a prophet. Noah is a preacher. And so here God is giving him a prophecy about the line of his son Ham, which is connected with what he did against Noah. And so it says, If cursed be Canaan, what shall become of their line? The lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. And so from the line of Canaan come all the ites, like the Cana knights, Jebu sites. Remember what Moses said to do concerning them? They are to be completely destroyed. We'll talk about that in the future. But what we need to know is that the line of Canaan was under a curse of our almighty God. Well, I wonder why. I mean, he just kind of looked at his father's nakedness and told a couple of people, right? What's the big deal? Why does it deserve like this kind of uh, punishment? And so let's go ahead and look at that again. Uh, go back to the... Yeah, I want you to focus on those two words. Cain, uh, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw, right, his father's nakedness and told his two brothers. Those two words, saw and told. Next slide. The word saw means to gaze at with great satisfaction. When you look at the Hebrew and the way it's arranged, it means he looked at it, gazed at it with great satisfaction. I wonder why. Ham told his brothers, and the word for told indicates he told with delight. I don't know. Uh, do you, you know, how do you feel when, you know, when you see someone that you don't like and bad things happen to them? How do you feel? Deep inside, you probably say, yeah, justice, right? Maybe someone was expelled. <laughs> I don't know, right? And so what do you do? You kind of like tell everyone with delight. You told you, I know what you're thinking right now, right? I mean, who wants to be expelled? And so here's Ham. He sees a bad thing. And he's delighted. And it delights him to tell people about what Noah did. Ham seems to have had a rebellious attitude against his father and his authority. He has a problem with pride. He doesn't want to be told what to do. In fact, he wants to be the one to tell people what to do. It's a power trip. At last, he found fault. He found fault. Or weakness with his father and wanted everyone to know that was the character of Ham so the sin of Ham really was to reject the authority of Noah and to dishonor and disrespect his father this is one of the few times the, the earliest times when we can see just how bad in the eyes of God it is to disrespect and dishonor your parents did you get that? This is why in the Old, in the Old Testament, in the, uh, New, the Ten Commandments, what did God include in the Ten Commandments? Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is 
giving you. It's the first promise of God with a promise. It's the first command of God with a promise added. What is that promise? You will live long in the land and you will prosper. On the other hand, if you dishonor or curse father or mother, Exodus 21, 17, and he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So you can see here how important the command is by looking at the reward when you obey and then looking at the punishment when you disobey. When you obey, the Bible says what? Long life, prosperity, disobey, what does it say? Put to death. What does that show you about the command to honor your father and mother? It's important to God. This is why God was really angry when Ham did that to his own father. Even the Lord Jesus Christ said something about that, right? Matthew 15 and the verses 4. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. So even during the Christian era, it's still operative. Honor your father and your mother. That is the command of God. Anyone who dishonors father or mother, that person shall be put to death. In other words, they are under God's curse. And this is why uh, Canaan, the line of uh, Ham, was under God's curse. Now, how about Japheth and Shem? Let's go to Genesis 9, 26 to 29. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. servant. Look at that. You see the put downs on, on Canaan. <laughs> And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So that's the end of chapter 9. But let's take a look at uh, Shem and Japheth. What is prophesied concerning Shem? It says here, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. The God of Shem. So Noah is prophesying. That the connection to God is through the line of Shem. This is why Shem would become the ancestor of Arphaxad, who is the grandfather of Abraham. Abraham became the father of many nations. Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons, right? And from the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, so basically, Shem became the father of the Hebrews, right? Well, how about Japheth? The Bible says God shall enlarge Japheth. And Japheth would become the ancestors of the, the Gentiles, the Greeks. This is why in the Bible we have the Jews and the Greeks, right? And we'll talk more about um, Shem and Japheth and Ham and where all the nations came from through the three sons of Noah in our future Bible studies. And so, if you were to ask, if I were to ask you again, which of the three sons of Noah would you prefer to be your ancestor? Who would it be? Shem. Shem. Why? Because the spiritual blessing was given to? Okay, but wait a minute. Why not Japheth? Who was the firstborn? Japheth. Why not Japheth? Why the secondborn? I don't know. <laughs> but is it a unique thing? No. As a matter of fact, next slide. Instances of God elevating the secondborn to the place of the firstborn. God chose Abel instead of? Who was the oldest? King. God chose Isaac instead of? Ishmael. Who was the oldest? Ishmael. God chose Jacob instead of? Esau. Who was the oldest? So it's not a new thing. When God chooses and elevates the secondborn to become the firstborn. This is why God, next slide, chooses the line of Shem to be the descendant or from which the promise seed, our Lord Jesus Christ, will come from. Canaan and his descendants, they are to be 
servants. Right? Now, that's the end of Genesis. Like what we always do in our Bible studies. Remember? We want you to look for, next slide, hints of Christ. Did you see it? Did you see the promise of Christ in Genesis 9? Raise your hand if you did. <laughs> when you just read it, you probably won't notice it right away. All right? But did you notice it? No? Or actually three. Yeah. Three hints of the promise of Christ in Genesis chapter 9. What is number one? Let's go to Genesis 9, 4. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood. That should give you a hint, right? The Bible is telling us the blood sacred. Why? Why is it called life? Next slide, Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Why was the blood called life? Because it represents atonement, forgiveness of sins during the days of the Old Testament. It was the blood of bulls and goats that would cleanse you so that you can worship God, right? But that pointed forward to the coming of the Lamb of God. And His shed blood is what will give us the right to serve the living God. And because of this blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, what can we hope for? Romans 5, 9 to 10, by His blood we are now put right with God. How much more then? Will we be saved by Him from God's anger? We were God's enemies, but He made us His friends through the death of His Son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? And so because of the blood of Christ, our sins are forgiven. We become the friends of God, and we have the hope for everlasting life. So in Genesis 9, uh, we read that the blood is life. Next slide. It's, it, it's a hint of the promise of everlasting life through the blood of the Lamb. What else? Where else can we see Christ? Genesis 9, 26, 27. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, right? And Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth. And he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. You know, there's a indication that the pronoun he there, where it says he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Who does that refer to? God. God shall dwell in the tents of Shem. Because God will enlarge Japheth, but he, God, will dwell in the tents of Shem. Remember Shem? He would be the ancestor to the Hebrews, Moses, David. What were they known for? Let's go take a look at Hebrews chapter 9, 1 to 5. What is that tent all about? What does it foreshadow? Hebrews 9, 1 down to 5. The first covenant had rules for worship and a place made for worship as well. A tent. See that? A tent was put up, the outer one, which was called the Holy place in it with the lampstand and the table with the bread offered to God behind the second curtain was the tent called the most holy place in it were the all were the gold altar for the burning of incense and the covenant box all covered with gold and contained the gold jar with the manna in it Aaron stick and that had sprouted leaves and the two stone tablets with the commandments written on them Above the box were the winged creatures representing God's presence. With their wings spread over the place where sins were forgiven. But now is not the time to explain everything in detail. So the tent represented by the tent of Shem was actually pointing to the promise of the tabernacle. And the tent of meeting during the days of Moses. Because in that tent called the most holy place, God would manifest his presence God in the tent of Shem but you know what this was not yet complete this was not a complete fulfillment why 
Well, if we look at the um, next slide, this is like the, the tabernacle. You have the courtyard. You have the tent, right? But the tent has two parts separated by, by a curtain. The outer part is called the holy place, right? The bigger one in, inside the tent. Underneath or behind that, separated by a curtain, is the most holy place. The most holy place is where God's presence is manifested. This is the system that was followed during the days of Moses. And this was also what was followed as a template for the temple of Solomon. But that was not a complete fulfillment. Why? Next slide. Hebrews 9, 6 to 7. This is how those things have been arranged. The priests go into the outer tent every day to perform their duties. But only the high priest goes into the inner tent. Only the high priest gets to go to the most holy place. And he does so only, how often? Yes. Once a year. He takes with him blood, which he offers to God on behalf of himself and for the sins, which the people have committed without knowing they were sinning. So what does the high priest do once a year? He gets to go into the most holy place and represent the people there with an offering, right? And it's a most holy place that is that's God's presence is manifested. However, 9, 11, and 12, but here's the good news. But Christ has already come as what? The high priest of the good things that are already here. The tent in which he serves is greater and more perfect. It is not a tent made by human hands. That is, it is not a part of this created world. When Christ went through the tent and entered once and for all into the most holy place, he did not take the blood of goats and bulls to offer as a sacrifice. Rather, he took his own blood and obtained eternal salvation for us. This is why when Christ died on the cross with his shed blood as an offering to God, what was given to us? Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. We have then, my friends, what does it say? Complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus, he opened for us a new way, a living way, through the curtain, that is, through his own body. That's why the tent, that also points to who? Jesus. Because through the curtain, we have access to the most holy place. Before, only the high priest, once a year. Today, we have complete freedom through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why the prophecy about Christ is he is to be given this name. Matthew 1 23, a virgin will become pregnant and have a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Why is it said that Jesus is God with us? Because through Jesus, we can be in the presence of God. He was the fulfillment, the final fulfillment of the tent, so that we can experience. The presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next slide. So the promise of Christ in Genesis 9. Everlasting life is through the blood of the Lamb. Number two. Christ would become the tent for God to be with us. And there's one more. Did you get it? <coughs> there's one more I found. There's probably others that I missed. Maybe some of you will find it in the future and let me know about it. Okay. But this is as far as I know. I was looking at it uh, intently, praying for it, and I can only find three. But you might be able to find more. But here's the final one I found. Genesis 9, 16. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on earth. So there's a covenant of God that is everlasting. But we all know there's going to be judgment day, right? How can it be everlasting? Because it may have a final fulfillment in Christ. What is the sign? Rainbow. Do you know where else you find rainbows in the scriptures? Next slide. Ezekiel 1, 26 to 28. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. And so this is a, a vision that God gave to Ezekiel. A vision of some future event, right? Some future scenario. I saw 
that from what happened to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down and I heard the voice of one speaking. What was the vision of Ezekiel? He saw a man by the throne of God having the rainbow around him. Who is that? Jesus. A vision, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. The glory of Christ. That's what he saw. Did we find that somewhere else? Revelation 4, 2 down to 3 at once. I was in the spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. So the rainbow again encircles the throne there in heaven. That represents glory in heaven. The glory of God's throne. And this is why... When we look at the uh, next slide, and next slide after that, Romans 8.17, are we going to have a part of that glory that was given to Christ? Since we are His children, we will possess the blessings He keeps for His people. And we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for Him. For if we share Christ's sufferings, we will also share His glory. And so the rainbow, that points to the future glory also that Christ will have and that we will have a share of. <clears throat> and so when we look, next slide, at the promise of Christ in Genesis, number one, the blood of the Lamb, right? It would be shed. What would that do? It will bring us into the presence of God. Number two. Is that temporary? Number three, it points to the future glory that we will share with our Lord Jesus Christ. So the presence of God is promised not only for this life, but especially we will have a share in the glory of God, the glory of Christ in the kingdom of heaven. That's why in Genesis 9, you can see all of that showing that indeed God is full of grace. Just because things may not appear to be going well for you now, rest assured, God is not yet finished with His plan. God is never caught by surprise. He knows exactly what's happening. And if ever we're going through sufferings now, Apostle Paul said, if we share in the sufferings of Christ, we will share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the promise of Christ. Genesis chapter 9. Let us all stand and we shall pray together. Almighty and merciful Father, thank you so much for your grace and abundant blessing. Always thinking of our future, our well-being. Thank you for caring for each and every one of us. Giving us hope, Father, that no matter what happens in our life, we know and we are assured your presence now will uplift us and encourage and strengthen us. And your presence in the future, that will be forever as we dwell with you in the kingdom that you are preparing for all of us. Amen. Thank you so much for your mercy. Bless each and every one of us here today and strengthen always our faith. We ask everything, Father, in the name of our 